what's up? Blah, blah, blah. What's up, everybody? John Grimsmo here. Um, I'm stuck. I'm getting annoyed by lots of things. So let's talk about it. First thing. So I'm on the lathe right now. I'm trying to make. This is kind of a stupid thing. I'm trying to make my own screws out of titanium, um, and they're tiny, and I'm being ridiculously precise with them, so they're causing me lots of headache. Um, just when I'm getting them to do what I want them to do, other things are not cooperating. For example, uh, I accidentally crashed into here. If you see this big ring around the outside, this is the collet that holds my material. Had a nice big crash in there because one little change on the computer added a whole bunch of tool paths that basically decided to tell the tool to move this far past the chuck or the call it. Um, but that's not really an issue. What bugs me is when you buy material, it's oversized. So it barely fits into the call it and is very annoying. Let's see, let's measure this. It's supposed to be one two or one eight seven five. This is coming in at about a thou bigger. Just just over one thousandth of an inch bigger. And that is big enough that the collet does not really like to expand and um, make it do that. It does slide, but my bar puller, when it goes to grab onto it, it uh, doesn't have enough grip to pull it forward. So let's hack this thing. I figured out a cool trick. I think it was um, Brad Martin, Tactical Keychains, that told me this. Um, but basically, screwdriver. This one happens to be too big, I think. Shove it in here, hammer it real good, and spread those things apart, and that should do it. Let's try it out. Whoa. I'm not having much luck with this thing. Um, I know when I've done this before, this is a 3 16 one. I've done it before with a quarter inch one and I remember I had to get the, the drill or the um, screwdriver really far inside and spread it out. So far I thought it was gonna break before it actually made a difference. So maybe I'm just not going far enough. Um, the other thing that you can do is use a metric collet, the next size up metric collet instead. I don't have any of those and I want this now. So I'll, I'll just keep banging on it until uh, I get it to work, I guess. These are cheap, so I don't I don't care if I ruin it, um, although I'd be screwed if I ruined it, I'd have to get another one anyway. Success, I did get it to work. Now I have a very loose fit here. It's a collet, so as you pull it, it is gonna come clamp and, and you know grip down on it. I had this screwdriver about this far into each gap before it would actually make a difference. So that is great. Okay, what else am I annoyed about right now? Usually I'm not too negative in my videos, and I'm not trying to be negative in this video. Uh, I'm just, it makes me feel better to share with you guys and not be so stuck in my head and annoyed and all that. So like I said, these titanium screws that I'm trying to make, why am I making titanium screws? Well, I don't know, because I want to? Is that the best reason I have? Maybe. Um, we have been using um, these stainless steel screws that we buy and they're okay um, I'd say they're like 80% good enough for our standards which has been okay for all of our knives so far but when we buy them they're too long so we have to cut the threads shorter and that's a bit time consuming and annoying and then Eric likes to polish the tops of all of them so they look better um, so I'm like, well, I want to make them myself. I have all the equipment I need to make them myself. If I do the process right, I think I can do it quickly and easily. Except it's taking me days and days to figure this out. To do it to my specifications. Um, so, I mean, it's a Torx screw. Whoa. If you can see the head on that thing. It's tiny. I'm trying to mill that with an end mill... A teeny, teeny, tiny end mill. Uh, let's see if I can find them here. I don't even know if you can see in that. It's 
super tiny, 20 thousandths of an inch, like the widths of, of four hairs put together is how micro this end mill is. Um, if you breathe on it wrong, it breaks. And I'm trying to cut titanium with it. It should work. My problem is that um, two days ago, Fusion 360 stopped doing this one job that I wanted it to do. All right, so if you think of my screw, this is the head of my screw right here, and this is the tool path that it has to do. Now, this is not the ideal tool path that I want to be using. I want to be using one, one called 2D Adaptive. And uh, for some reason, two days ago, that just stopped working. It wouldn't calculate, it wouldn't generate in the code, or in the program. I don't know why. I'm trying to contact um, Autodesk to figure out what the heck is going on. This is a 2D parallel, a 3D parallel, I think, with morphed spiral. And it should work pretty good, but I broke the first tool. But I mean, these moves are tiny, very tiny. Um, so I, I don't know why it doesn't work anymore. It's really bothering me. Because it did work a couple days ago, and I've milled a lot of my pivots, which also have the t same torques in them. Um, I've milled those successfully. I don't know what the pro what happened to the program. Maybe an update that they did affected this particular thing. Um, anyway, Eric just suggested, I've been at this for like a day and more. Um, Eric just suggested to do it in SolidWorks and HSM works, which I don't use much anymore, but I still have. Um, and I'm like, I didn't even think about that. So let's do it like that. Got to remember to show you guys my new hat. Ooh, my wife got these for Eric and I for Christmas. Pretty cool. I don't actually wear hats very much, but maybe I'll start. I think what's bugging me most about these screws and a lot of the other little things that I'm trying to make is not so much the process itself. I actually really enjoy the R&D process. What's bugging me the most is that it's so time consuming at a time in our career when all we really should be doing is getting knives out the door. And it's taking me forever to get these last little things wrapped up. I mean, we're 95 plus percent to getting our new knife, the Rask, shipped out the door. And I am getting hung up on little things like screws. Now, perfection is very important to me. So that's where this disconnect comes from, is that I'm spending so much time making everything perfect, and I don't want to ship something out that's not the best I can make it. So, I don't know, I'm just kind of battling with that in my head um, and how long it's taking. Let me show you the fixture that I made to machine the Torx pattern in the top. So I had a scrap fixture here. What this is, is a Mighty Bite Uniforce clamp that as you tighten the screw, the clamp expands and it's holding down six at a time except I broke the end mill. It should work, the fixture should work just fine. But it's this little, little tiny tool that is broken and gone now, missing, that uh, is not working. I just can't help but ask myself if this is a worthwhile endeavor, making our own screws, when we could just as easily use the stainless steel ones. They're not as good, not as cool, they can't be anodized, they're not made by us. If we can make this, if we can make our pivots, which we are, um, that means we're making pretty much every single component to the knife, which is really cool, and that's what I want to do. So I totally forgot the caveat to spreading out the collet, and the downside to what happens is that this diameter is kind of a precision fit inside the lathe, and as we spread it out and made it bigger, now the collet won't go in there. Uh, so I forgot this is what I had to do before on my other ones. Can't even get it out now. Got it. Um, so basically I need to measure what this diameter is because that's the standard diameter and I need to grind the rest of this down to be that size. Michitoyu says 1.2490 1.2620. So we are about 10, 12, 12 or 13 thou, I think. Big, that's okay. Let's go grind it. Perfect, 
Absolutely not. Will it do the trick? Absolutely. And as much as I love precision for some things, for other things, you just gotta just get it done. Don't care too much. This will work great. That is a good looking screw. I even have the front thread has what's called a Higby thread on it, which is where I use, if you see at the end of that machining footage, the grooving tool does a little quick little threading operation where it puts a ramp on the very first thread so that usually when you machine a thread, it uh, kind of the first thread kind of flaps over and this removes that and puts a nice ramp on it. Just Google Higby thread if you're into turning stuff. Um, it's really cool. And that is the kind of stuff that gets me excited and geeks me out. But uh, I like it. It's really, really cool. So now I have the screws good. I have the bar puller pulling good. I can run, so like a bar, bar like that does about 56 screws. I should be able to run it. We'll see what kind of tolerance I can hold over a bigger run. Um, that being said, I am trying to do things lean and not try to do huge, huge batch work. So 56 is a, a big run, but I kind of want to get our stockpile ahead of schedule, like a little bit ahead before we start doing smaller batches. Um, and we'll see how that turns out. So next, if I still can't get Fusion to work, I'm going to write up that code in SolidWorks and then we're going to route on the Mori and uh, hopefully it'll do good. It goes without saying that normally when I would machine a part like that, especially in titanium, I'd be using flood coolant, but with coolant, you really can't see anything, and I didn't want to get the camera all wet. So I did that one dry for the camera, for you guys. All right, now I've got the same thing coated up in SolidWorks. There's a zoomed in view of my, my screw. Uh, it's currently calculating the code. 18.3, we might see 18 there, it's 18.4. It is also taking forever. Um, although this is actually pro processing, making progress. Um, I don't know why it's taking so long. This is ridiculous. And it's, uh, let's see. Yeah, it's cranking out my, my RAM as well, all the way at the top, eight gigs. So I'm on my laptop right now, 16 gigs of RAM. This screen is actually, um, Google Chrome desktop viewer, which is basically looking at my desktop at home. It's like a go to my PC or um, other things like that. I forget what else, who else does that. But yeah, this is, this is my computer at home now. Dual screens that I'm viewing. Um, 18.6, uh, this is taking forever. It should not be this difficult. Abort. So I tried it again. Instead of doing the step over at 1.5 tenths, I'm doing it now 10 times bigger step over at 1.5 thou. And as you can see, it is creeping up my resource monitor, my memory there. It's still only at 16.5 after a minute or two. And uh, 
what is going on here? I've done this before. I don't know why it's being so difficult in two different software. And I haven't, I know I haven't updated the HSM works here, so it's not an update from that. It's just weird, man. Is what I'm trying to do that difficult? Yes, it's a very intricate toolpath, but it should just calculate. Alright, so it wasn't fast, but I was finally able to get this working in SolidWorks. Using the strategy that I want, the 2D Adaptive. Let's check it out here. Drill, drill, pocket out, so it's going to do a little clearance hole. It's going to do a 2D Adaptive, this is more like it. So it goes into every corner and it goes zip, 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 zip. I like that, and then uh, chamfer at the end. And another neat feature is uh, I have a manual pass-through code. So what that is, for those of you who are into uh, HSM Works and Fusion, you can go New Operation, Manual NC, and you can input a pass-through code. Most of these don't work. You have to make them work. So if you scroll down to pass through, and this way, everything you type in here will get directly put into your code. Now, it's they say right here, it's a last resort thing. If you know how to work it, it works very well. So be careful and learn. There's some really good po posts on the HSM and Fusion forums to do that. Um, quick thing, so if I type like M5 to turn the spindle off, if you type comma, then it, it puts the next line on the next line. So I could type M8, comma, uh, I don't know, whatever, M99, whatever. Or you can put it all on one line with no commas. So what I did is I'm doing it for, it says G5.1 Q1, which turns my Mori into a high-speed machining center and lets it read the code faster and process it faster, apparently. So, yeah, Q1 turns it on and Q0 turns it off. So this is a very intricate, very tight code. I mean, the tool is just shaking around, basically. So any little help I can get will do that. And then the next code, which is really, really cool. If you can read this, M9 to turn the coolant off, G65, P9858, T2, 1215, Y clearance of 20 thou, Z height of 5 thou, H 8 tenths. And what this is, it's automatic tool breakage detection, which is really cool. So it's going to machine the part, and then it's going to go zip, zip, beep, 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 and then go up. And if it's broken, it'll stop here and alarm out. If it's good, it'll keep going all the way up. So. Breakage, breakage detection uh, has been handy, it's been helpful, because if one tool breaks, the next tool is probably going to break as well, and that's just expensive. So this is really cool. Now, last thing is, to get the pass-through to work, you have to hack your post-processor. So here I have my Fanuc, whoa, my Fanuc John post-processor. I'm going to open config. And if you see it, the, I'm scrolling to the very bottom. I added this line of text. Pause the screen, write that down if you're going to do it. This little block right here. Yes, it's a touch screen. That's pretty cool. Um, put that at the end of your post anywhere. And that will allow you to do the pass through. So function on pass through text, blah, 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 blah. I found that on the forums and it works dandy. All right, 
I'm ready to post this code, run it on the Mori. Let's see if I can do it without breaking a tool. Here we go. So the only thing about making such teeny, teeny, tiny parts is finding them afterwards. Now this is not a lot of chips yet because I only ran 12 parts, but to find a part right where my middle finger is pointing, there's the part in this chip. The part is smaller than the chip. But if I throw it down, I can hear it bounce. Whereas, like an empty chip, it doesn't have that noise. So that's kind of my indication. Weird, huh? So tiny. I could rig up a parts catcher, but these ones tend to stick to their long string anyway. So I don't know if that would work for this. But I should try it anyway. Here's a quick little thought that I just had. So all these little screws that I'm making, when they come off the machine from the parting tool that cuts them off, there's a long curly cue that's attached to it, which is kind of handy for finding the parts, but I gotta break everyone off, and that means that every piece is now stuck into like a big pile of chips. And a lot of them have little burrs, uh, like little stringy bits attached to the threads. So I'm trying to think of ways to lean out the process and to, to make my finishing, like my pickup time, a lot shorter. So everyone has a little nib at the end, whatever you call it, and uh, instead of parting it off straight through, what if I go and stop at that nib just for half a second and then keep going and that will break the chip so that it'll go break the chip and then plow it off basically. And that should get rid of that big thing. And then maybe uh, for the, getting the stuff off the threads, maybe I can reverse the spindle and turn it the other way around and have some sort of like bristle brush that just cleans the threads off real quick. I don't know, it's a thought. I almost forgot, I have to uh, zero this tool. Now that I've put in a different tool, the machine needs to know where it is. So to do that, we'll go uh, MDI, I'm in tool 15. So I'm typing in uh, G65P9857T15, end of block, insert. That line right there. Cycle start. Turn my rapids down a little bit. It goes up, it moves over, it goes down. There you go. Now for these tiny tools, I usually like to slow it down even more when it's touching because I don't want it to break while touching off. Um, but I forgot because I'm filming. So I wasn't thinking properly. And then I've got this machine wirelessly connected to my computer, which is awesome. So uh, to access the file, DNC, program list, and I'll go up, which brings me to the bottom of the list. SW SolidWorks Torx 01 input, there it is. The Tormac has a nice graphical display, this doesn't. Um, I'm kinda, I kinda miss that. But let's see what we can do here. I'm not quite sure how you wanna film this. Um, we're just gonna film through the door cause I don't wanna mess with the uh, camera inside right now. Cycle start. Calling up a tool. There we go. So the first few tools are simply going to uh, open up the hole, basically. So that was a spotting tool, basically. Here's a drill bit. It's going to drill the clearance hole. Here's a 1 16th end mill. It's gonna go down and just open the hole up a tiny little bit. Give it a nice flat bottom. Anything you can do to make that tiny tool uh, have, a, have an easier life. Now here's our tiny tool. And we'll see what it does. Very exciting, isn't it? Can't see anything. 
But we'll see what happens when it goes to um, probe the tool. It does not look broken. Let's see. If it goes all the way up, we're good. Yeah! One more tool chamfer. See that top, just the top corner one is all that we did. Can't even see it. That's the thing with micro parts is I don't know how to film micro tiny parts. I don't have the macro set up yet. This is just my GoPro right now. I do have macro lenses for the GoPro, but they're kind of a, a little annoying to use and I can't talk because it has to be in the case. And this always beeps at you when it's done. Things are good, tool did not break. It took a bit longer than I wanted to, well, the run, but I mean, I spent the whole day doing this, driving me nuts, but uh, progress is good, feels good. Let's take it off, we'll see what it looks like. Well, that wraps up this video. I gotta go, I'm late already. Um, so that was an interesting day. I'm really glad I got to share it with you guys because that made me happier. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, I just would have been stuck in my head and kind of stressed out about it. Um, it. It made it kind of fun to share the problems and mistakes. So that's a good thing, and I need to do that more because it's good for me. Uh, I know I've been slacking on videos lately, except for all the, the really long ones, the Q&As lately. Um, but hopefully this was fun for you guys. This was uh, fun for me. I'm, I finally have success today today worked. Uh, I only got to mill two Torx patterns, but I think Eric can come in tomorrow on Saturday. He's planning on coming in a little bit and because uh, he skipped out today. And uh, he should be able to run the uh, run six at a time of the milling the Torx heads, and he can run as many as he needs because he's got some knives to finish up, and that's the last thing he's waiting for. So that's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, I'm going home for the weekend. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed the process, and uh, there will be more videos like this coming up. Take care. Bye.